Same thing if you come into like a bench press, right? If you get are getting stuck just before lockout, maybe your triceps are too weak. If you're getting stuck down to the bottom, maybe you need to you know do some paused reps or something like that to help, uh, or maybe some block presses to help you to build that starting strength out of the bottom. Maybe working on doing some negatives, you know, uh, have some pins set up, focus just on the negative portion, and then maybe just pushing against that resistance at the bottom. And you're not fo uh, worried about crushing yourself with that load, but you don't have to worry about pushing it back up. You just Lower it down the bottom, push as hard as you can, and then just leave it on the pick, on the on the pins, right? It's not going to get the full range of motion. That's why you want to go with a little lighter weight that you can handle. Work on those pause reps, right? Hello, Aaron Kubitz, personal trainer, Functional Aesthetic CC, helping average guys perform better inside and outside the gym. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about the third mistake that people often make when they're trying to build muscle. Now, I am not a competitive bodybuilder. I have some interest in that. I started out as 145 pound long distance runner. Um, and so because of that, I, well, and for various different reasons, I actually, the reason I got into lifting weights is because I injured my back, and so I couldn't uh, run for a while, and so I was riding my bike, and then in the winter time, we didn't have fat tire back, bikes back when I was in high school, so I had to find some way to try to stay in shape during the winter months, and all we had was one of those, you know, clunky fan bikes, and it got really annoying to try to ride that bike uh, for, you know, extended period of time down in my parents' basement. So my dad, who had been a power lifter, uh, showed me how to do some uh, basic powerlifting exercises, bench presses, things like that, right? And so that's how I got started with lifting. So fast forward all these years, I still really enjoy uh, running and endurance exercises, but I really developed a love for um, strength training as well. And um, I guess if I flip back here a little bit, give you a little bit more context as well. For those of you who don't know, um, towards, towards the end of my senior year of high school, after building about 30 pounds of muscle uh, through powerlifting, I actually ended up getting really bad digestive issues, which caused me to lose completely all the muscle that I gained through the um, course of my uh, strength training, you know, a couple of years of strength training there. In the next two years, I progressively lost all of it while I was going to college. And then over the next 10 years, I worked to figure out how to heal my digestive system and get myself back up to speed. And one of the things that started, uh, that was kind of the foundation of helping me come back from that was getting into natural bodybuilding, learning about proper nutrition, proper training, all these different kinds of things like that. And through that process, I was actually able to come back and uh, develop and become even better than I was in high school, um, getting up to about 185 pounds, just simply, mainly just through eating properly, uh, not getting too much into the into the uh, training side even at that point because I was not feeling so good. And um, then I ended up losing, or ended up, getting a job where I was stuck outside uh, year round, whether it's, you know, in the Wisconsin winter where you get like uh, negative, you know, temperatures and then it's like in the, you know, um, gets pretty hot and humid in the summertime too. Uh, not as hot and humid as the, uh, as the southern states, but it was pretty, um, 
you know, a lot of a lot of extremes there, and also a lot of physical activity I was doing during this time, and so I had to also adjust how I was training and everything. So that was a little bit of my background um, during that time. Initially, I lost like 20 pounds of weight when I first started that job, just because it was very busy. I didn't have enough time to eat the proper amount of macros and stuff in my carefully planned out diet. But then over the course of the next couple of years, I got up to 210 pounds, uh, all while staying uh, below 10% body fat uh, while doing that, and that whole experience you know during that journey taught me a lot about training what the body's capable of and how nutrition uh, really impacts the performance of your body so I say all this to preface the fact that um, I am NOT a competitive bodybuilder my main goals are not to become the biggest or the strongest rather to become more or less a hybrid athlete right so while I I do not train strictly for you know strength and perf uh, strength and hypertrophy. I do know a thing or two about it, having built um, about 60 pounds of muscle, or you know not pure muscle because you're going to gain a little bit of fat during that process and stuff. But from that 145 pound weight, uh, after losing all the muscle in high school, uh, building it up initially, you know, from 145 pound distance runner, 175 pounds through powerlifting, losing it all building it back, losing it, and then building it back again, and just all the different uh, ups and downs of my training career over the past 15, 16 years that I've been doing this, this kind of stuff. So today, I'm gonna to be talking about the third in a series, as I talked about at the beginning uh, in the intro of this video, The third, this is the third part in this 12-part uh, series on 12 common mistakes that can, pre that can stall or hinder your growth in the gym. And so today we're going to be talking about the importance of having a structured plan, having progression, a plan of progression in your training uh, to make sure that you are not stagnating. Okay, so some of you might have heard the term newbie gains, or the rapid development of strength and even muscle mass during the first few months, uh, up to like six months to a year of training, where your progress, your strength, even development of muscle size is gonna be the best that it's ever going to be, uh, simply because it's a novel new stimulus for the body, right? You have a lot of untapped potential that's laying dormant there in the body, and actually the first month or two of training, a lot of the progress that you make is not actually from getting stronger per se, that you built more muscle, right? But that you just increased the uh, coordination of the muscles, right? You have more, uh, the motor units and the signals from the nervous system are causing them to fire more in, uh, in conjunction with one another, right? Rather than in this somewhat of a staccato pattern where you have one firing and then another firing and then another firing, you have them all in one concerted effort creating synergy and thus able to, uh, causing you to more completely and more efficiently utilize your existing muscles and your existing base of strength. So they've actually shown that untrained individuals, even working with very light weights, between 40 to 50% of the one rep max, if they're training for very high repetitions, can actually see increases in muscular size, even with very light loading. Okay, And this actually reminds me of a story from when I was back in my early 20s. A friend of mine was talking about a female friend of his who was complaining that or decided to stop running because her calves were getting too big from running. And my initial thoughts for this, and I'm going to go off in a little bit of a side trail from the main topic of the video here to talk about this. My initial thoughts were, if your legs are growing bigger from running, 
which is a natural activity and which is a, an aerobic activity, right? It's not particularly designed to get you bigger muscles. That's probably the size that your body is meant to be. And or you might need to uh, decrease the amount that you're eating or something like that, right? Now, people could, because people who are very heavy, if they start running, right, it's like you're doing these calf raises with a lot of weight on the body and that's, the, that's why a lot of times people who are, have a lot of extra weight will often have very large calves as well simply because of carrying the weight of their body. But with that being said, if you're doing a natural normal activities and one of the things that I think is like a, a basic metric for evaluating your, your fitness and strength, right, is to be able to handle your own body weight in a variety of contexts, right? Not everybody wants to be a power lifter, strong man or a bodybuilder and to really take their muscular development and their strength to the limits. However, I think Everyone should strive to be able to handle their body weight, being, being able to do things like push-ups, do a handstand, being able to do pull-ups, pull yourself up over the bar, and then if you want, you can get to a little bit more advanced things of that, of that nature and stuff, but just the ability to handle your own body weight, pull yourself up over a wall, whatever the case may be, is a general base level of strength that most people should be able to achieve and should aim for in their training. So today, this thing of body positive positivity is somewhat of a pushback on <clears throat> the somewhat unrealistic standards that have been uh, portrayed and oftentimes because of the use of um, performance enhancing drugs and things of that nature, right? And so you have these extreme measures of beauty you know, right? And, and, and women tend to be a little bit more susceptible to this than, than men do, but it even tends to come around with men as well, right? They start seeing these guys who got the six pack abs, all this different stuff like that, and maybe they start feeling a little bit self-conscious about it. Now, it is interesting that at the same time we have this body positivity thing going on, we also have at the other end of the extreme, very young individuals, very young guys, even in their 20s, who are starting to feel like they have to get on steroids simply because of what they see on social media, right? A lot of these guys, if their physique looks too good to be true, very often it is, right? Just think about like with Liver King, right? I was thinking, man, initially I really wanted to believe that he was natural because I was looking at him and I was like, well, yeah, he lives a pretty ideal life. He has lots of resources. He gets out in the sun all the time. He eats very nutri nutrient-dense food, trains very hard, has a very, you know, well thought out, because I agree with a lot of the concepts that he teaches, right? But I was thinking, man, I've been training a long time. I know a lot about this nutrition stuff. I've been doing very extreme kind of workouts like he's done uh, at, at certain points and stuff, and I never quite achieved quite that level of you know, muscularity and leanness at the same time. And so, sure enough, it turns out he was taking a lot of performance enhancing drugs, right? And so even like guys, like I remember back in the early 2000s, that Z's uh, guy or whatever, right? He was on drugs as well. So a lot of times guys will look at this and they think, man, I gotta take this so I look like that. So at the same time we have the body positivity movement going on, we also have the, uh, the other end of the spectrum where guys are feeling like they have to take drugs in order to uh, in, in order to look a certain way right and in order to keep up with things and this is my take on this right a lot of times when people feel self-conscious I think when we th let me back up a little bit when we think about the ego right we typically think of somebody who is full of themselves right they're cocky arrogant overly confident something like that right but if you think about it very often the reason somebody rubs you the wrong way, their achievements or whatever they're showing, showcasing, is because sometimes it's an affront to your own ego. It makes you feel bad about yourself. It is, it, uh, you know, hurts your pride, hurts your ego, makes you feel like you're not good enough, therefore you dislike that, right? There's a principle also that if you make somebody feel good about themselves, they're automatically going to feel better about you. So vice versa, if you make somebody feel bad about themselves, they're automatically going to feel less good. Uh, they're not going to like you as much, right? And so if you look at this body positivity thing, right, it's very oftentimes people who have tried to fit the mold or achieve these certain body standards or performance standards, right, and were unable to do so themselves, and so then they push 
for this thing that anybody, like any way you look, you're healthy at any size, any shape, any weight, anything like that, because they weren't able to achieve it. And it's a very similar thing to with people who are, uh, don't like people who are rich and they think, oh, this guy's a scumbag, he's a crook, whatever the case may be. But at the same time, they want to be rich themselves, right? And so we have to consider that as well. Now, my take, and, and because while at the same time, some people are saying we should be okay, it's okay to look however you look. Other people are taking drugs so they could look a certain way that's unnatural and unachievable through natural means, right? So we have both of these things, the, the ego driving this thing and the ego driving this thing, right? Now, my take on this is that we all have unique genetic potential for aesthetics and for performance, right? And this comes down to the fact that we have different distributions of ratios of different muscle fiber types. Some people have higher uh, levels of fast twitch muscle fibers, which is gonna make them excel at things like strength training, sprinting, uh, playing um, soccer, wrestling, you know, football, things like that. And then you have people who have a high distribution of slow twitch muscle fiber types, which makes them excel at things like extreme endurance events, right? Be able to run a marathon at a very fast pace for a very long period of time simply because, uh, and, and different factors like that, right? Most people lie somewhere in the medium of that, right? But there are these extremes, right? And so that's one thing. Then you also have differences in where do the muscles insert, right? So for example, somebody like somebody taking all the drugs in the world, right? And having the perfect diet and the perfect workout routine, doing everything the same as Arnold Schwarzenegger, is probably never going to achieve the level of development that Arnold had in his biceps. I still think today that there's, you know, definitely people who have better conditioning than they had in the past, you know, people who have, you know, better leg development than Arnold had, better, you know, core, six pack, all that kind of stuff. But I still think to this day, Arnold Schwarzenegger has some of the best biceps in history. And a lot of that comes down to your genetics, right? Same thing with Flex Wheeler, right? The guy had just these muscle bellies, perfect, tiny little waist, all this kind of stuff. And then you look, compare him to another bodybuilder, Branch Warren, right? The guy was able to get in very good condition, but his bone structure, his hips, made it so that his, his waist was wider, right? He was very lean, very conditioned, but he just didn't have that small waist to enable to have the X frame, right? And so, was he not in good shape because he didn't have that perfectly aesthetically looking body? No, he was in phenomenal shape. He was, great, he was in great shape and stuff, but he just didn't have the genetics to have that fit that certain look. So when you're doing your training, right, when you're pursuing your fitness goals, think about becoming the best version of you. And if you have that competitive event, look at what are the things that I naturally excel at? What are the things that I'm naturally good at? Look at, you know, for example, muscle, muscle insertion points, right? And I've talked about this in some other videos, right? If you're flexing your arm like this or whatever at 90 degrees and you can fit, you know, a, a couple, you know, more than like uh, two or three fingers in between where the muscle starts and the joint ends there and you got that long tendon thing, you have a short muscle belly, right? You're probably not going to be a bodybuilding champion uh, because you don't like, if your muscle gets bigger, it's gonna come out farther this way and you're never gonna have that muscle that just rises right out of the joint there, right? You don't have the long muscle bellies that typically look more aesthetic, right? And you might actually uh, tend to perform better in a, uh, a hybrid classification or even an endurance uh, standpoint because those uh, muscle insertions tend to lend more towards repetitive contractions, a biomechanical efficiency of doing uh, repetitive contractions over a long period of time, it's gonna make you better at that, right? And so you can think about, okay, how does my body design, how is it shaped, and then go and train in a way that is going to capitalize on the way that your body is naturally formed. Now, being fat is not a natural state, right? There are uh, certain people who are naturally leaner, right? And there are certain people who are naturally carry a little bit more body fat on their body. And this comes out to uh, your weight set point, right? And this is something that, you know, they debated about, but it, to a certain extent, you can't adjust it, right? It's, it means the weight that your body without extreme, you know, making yourself extremely miserable, miserable, extreme dieting 
will be able to maintain in a healthy state, right? And so some people, you know, they're gonna really struggle. They're gonna feel miserable if they're trying to go below 10% body fat, right? Other people, you know, somewhere between 10, 15% body fat for a guy, you know, a little bit higher for a woman, that's where they're gonna be, you know, they're gonna feel healthy at that point. And if they wanna get leaner, they're gonna start just feeling, you know, like crap, like they're starving all the time, right? And so there, there, there is that. But anybody should be able to achieve a healthy body fat percentage, which is somewhere for a guy, 15% uh, body fat down to about, you know, five or 6% body fat. And most people aren't gonna be in that five or 6% range. But if you can get down to 15% body fat, there's no reason you should be at 30 or 40% body fat. Um, if you are, it very likely means that you have poor nutrition habits or you're not training and exercising consistently, um, not sleeping enough, or you have a thyroid condition. And when they've done the research, the majority, it's only like 2% of people that have thyroid conditions and other extreme conditions that cause them to have difficulty losing weight. The majority of the time it comes down to your habits. So address your habits first and then because without actually doing the work, out actually doing the stuff, you have no idea what your actual potential is. Again, it's like untapped potential. You gotta put in the work to figure out what your body is truly capable of doing. Okay, so now getting back to the topic of progression. As I said, when you're a beginning lifter, you're going to be able to see pretty rapid progressions, uh, irregardless of having a particularly well-structured program. If you have a well-structured program, you're gonna see much better results, but in the beginning, prov uh, applying any sort of resistance consistently is going to provide you with some progress, some gains, right? Now you don't wanna be focusing simply on isolation of movements because that's not going to progress you as well as you would like, right? However, if you're doing your squats, if you're doing your bench press, if you're doing your overhead presses, uh, deadlifts, things like that, you're gonna see some good progress very rapidly in the uh, initial stages of your programming. However, after a year of, of consistent training, maybe a year and a half, two years, that progress is gonna be much harder to come by. You're gonna to have to get more creative with how you do it. And one thing that often happens is that people don't, one of, I guess another of the problem with, uh, with training with programming is that people will pick a handful of exercises they like and they'll go in and they'll do the exact same routine over and over and over again without any plan for how they're going to progress it, how they're going to make it better. The other thing that they will do is sometimes something that we call it, um, workout ADD. They'll be hopping from one program to the next, to the next, to the next, because they saw this guy on Instagram doing this, this guy on YouTube talking about this. This one here is supposed to provide the most uh, muscle growth possible. Jeff Nippard was talking about, oh, this is better, you know, doing full body splits. So let's split uh, from doing the bro splits to doing the full body thing and back and forth and back and forth. And as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of different workout programs that are gonna work well and develop and provide good results, but if you don't stick with them long enough and you're constantly switching exercises or switching routines, the body doesn't have enough time to adapt to the stimulus so that it can overcome it and progress, right? With that being said, you do need to have some variation and change in planning for progression. One of the easiest ways to do this is called linear periodization, right? where you basically start out with a weight, um, and how you can figure this out is say, let's say you're doing a basic bodybuilding program that says do eight to 12 repetitions for you know 
uh, th three to four sets on this exercise. So what you do is you would start out on the lower end of that repetition range, so like eight repetitions. And let's say, for example, you're doing a lat pull down. You would do uh, as many, uh, you pick a weight that you can do eight repetitions while still having maybe one or two reps in the tank with. And that's what you start out with, right? So you don't go all the way to the max, right? Pick something that you can, you know, you know, figure out what the max is and then back it off just a little bit. And that's where you start your training with. And then every week you try to increase the weight for the upper body, maybe two and a half to 5% of whatever you're doing before for the lower body, five to 10% increase that load, right? And so what you're trying to do is either do more repetitions with the same load every week or add a little bit of weight, uh, weight each week and perform the same number of repetitions with a slightly heavier weight, okay? And what I would typically do is start out trying to perform more repetitions with the same amount of weight. When you can no longer perform more repetitions with the same weight, then you increase the weight. And now if you get up to 20 repetitions or more, then I would say you should probably be increasing the weight regardless of whether or not you can keep on adding. But chances are that likely won't happen. So first try to increase the number of repetitions you can do with the same amount of weight. And then once you stall there, then try to increase the amount of weight you're able to do with that amount of repetitions, right? And then when you hit a point where you can either increase the weight or increase the number of repetitions with that weight, that's when you would want to incorporate somewhat of a deload, right? Where you back off and you do a period of training where you're not trying to progress or trying to push yourself and maybe uh, reduce the training intensity by as much as 50%. And actually, as I've talked about, uh, I don't know, if I think I was talking about this in a, a video on Facebook last week, is the way that I like to do this is not even necessarily doing the same barbell lifts. Just get out of the gym entirely and go and do other activities, you know? Sometimes I like to go out hiking, you know, if you're going out paddling a canoe around or a kayak, uh, climbing up ropes, climbing trees, practice some calisthenics moves. Um, right now I'm actually trying to, and this is barbell stuff, right? But right now I'm trying to improve my technique with the barbell clean and the barbell snatch, right? And so, it's not going to be necessarily a really big muscular training stimulus for me, but it's going to be a uh, helping me to work on my technique while I'm giving my body a little bit of a, bit of a rest, right? And so I'm not as concerned about how much weight I'm moving or anything like that. I'm more concerned with just stimulating the body and helping to build that coordination and, um, and, and the timing of how to do these exercises appropriately. And then after you know a week or two of doing that, then you can start gradually incre increasing your uh, your load again from where you left off. So maybe going back down to wherever you started off, uh, whatever that number was, start at maybe week two for week one of this cycle. So whatever weight you were using in week two or week three of that cycle, start in week one with that weight and try to build on that with the same uh, kind of progression, all right? Okay guys, so in summary, change is good. Consistency is also good. However, either one done to the exclusion of the other is going to stunt your growth. So, in the beginning, you wanna be consistent. Find a program that you are confident in, that you believe in. Follow that program consistently for at least, you know, a few months, right? And even continue to follow this program until it no longer is producing results, right? When you are stalling out on your programming, you're not getting any stronger, you're not building any more muscle, then go back to the drawing board but and change it up, right? Switch it up, but don't just randomly switch it up because randomly switching things won't lead to results. As they say, all exercise is good for something, but not all exercise is good for everything. So when you make this change, when you switch it up, make sure that it's in alignment with what your goals are. And it's okay for your goals to change over time, but just make sure that whatever changes you're making make sense for where you're trying to go. Simply swapping out exercises because you're bored of this one or bored of that one isn't going to help you achieve your long-term goals and, if, and in some cases might even, if it's really bad, can make you actually go in reverse. So take some time to sit down 
and look at it and be like, okay, this program isn't producing results anymore. What are the areas that I feel are the sticking points or the, the, the limiting factors that are holding me back, right? You want to assess all the different variables that can cause you to progress. So things like, first and foremost, you want to be looking at, okay, how is my nutrition? How is my sleep, right? How am I recovering from those workouts, right? And then you want to be looking at the workout itself. You know, what is the total volume? Is there enough intensity? You know, what reps am I using? How many sets am I using per exercise? Um, what is the rest period in between these sets that I'm using? And then what are the specific exercises that I'm using, right? Because certain exercises are going to provide more benefit to certain muscle groups at, um, than uh, certain areas of a muscle fiber than other exercises, right? So for example, deadlifts are going to work your hamstrings, right? But they're also going to work a bunch of other exercises and that uh, other muscles. And that's why we like to incorporate compound movements because they work a lot of muscles. They're the best bang for your buck, right? However, if you truly want to optimize your muscular development, you need to be incre increasing more volume. You also be, need to be uh, hitting the muscles from different angles, different stimulus. Uh, novel stimulus is going to cause the muscles to grow a little bit more, but do it in the right fashion. The other thing is, Romanian deadlifts are also going to hit the hamstrings in a very similar way to deadlifts, but slightly different. You kind of take the quadriceps out of the equation when you're doing the Romanian deadlift. It's a lot more focused on the hamstrings and the glutes, right? And then still further yet, if you're doing Nordic curls or you're doing uh, lying uh, hamstring curls on a bench or something, that's going to provide a different stimulus yet. And so you can think about too, like what is the level of intensity of these exercises for how you want to order them in your workouts. When you're looking at the hamstring curl, there's di uh, you know, different heads that you have on the hamstrings, right? It's not just one muscle. There's different parts of that muscle, different heads, just like the biceps, right? So with the hamstrings, certain ways that you angle your foot position is going to hit either like the outer, outer heads, the inner heads, things like that. And so if you're seeing, man, I'm, I'm, my development in this area is a little bit lacking, how can I best hit that group and increase it? Same thing if you come into like a bench press, right? If you get, are getting stuck just before lockout, maybe your triceps are too weak. If you're getting stuck down to the bottom, maybe you need to you know, do some paused reps or something like that to help, uh, or maybe some block presses to help you to build that starting strength out of the bottom. Maybe working on doing some negatives, you know, uh, have some pins set up, focus just on the negative portion, and then maybe just pushing against that resistance at the bottom, you're not fo uh, worried about crushing yourself with that load. But you don't have to worry about pushing it back up, you just lower it down to the bottom, push as hard as you can, and then just leave it on the pick, on the on the pins, right? It's not going to get the full range of motion. That's why you want to go with a little lighter weight that you can handle. Work on those pause reps, right? And so that's what I mean by making calculated decisions and calculated changes to your program, not just switching it up at random, but make sure that when you switch it up, when you change it, that it makes sense for your intended goals. All right, guys, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button in uh, below. It really helps the algorithm for other people who might enjoy this kind of content. If you'd like to see more content related to uh, workout design for either losing fat, building muscle, athletic performance, particularly hybrid athlete style athletic performance, how to uh, eat for both building muscle and losing body fat, how to train around injuries should you sustain them, and also how to prevent getting those injuries in the first place, then consider subscribing to the channel by hitting the button in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. And we'll see you all next time for more health and fitness information.